because what you don't know about energy can kill you. Here's Alex Epstein. Welcome to Power Hour. Sitting in for Alex Epstein this week is Stefan Henna, head of research at the Center for Industrial Progress. Hey, Stefan. Hey, Dom. And I'm Dom Watkins, Director of Education at CIP. So let's dive right in. And uh, Stefan, why don't you kick us off this week with your first story? Okay, so I have two news items that caught my eyes uh, last week, actually. Uh, and I think they have relevance for the broader context of uh, this fight between pro and con energy uh, politics. And the first item comes from uh, Germany. And uh, there's a German professor uh, named uh, Nico uh, Pech, in, uh, and he had an interview in German public radio last week, and he is a growth critic and uh, economist. And uh, so he had something to say about the proposed CO2 tax in Germany, which is now proposed to be about 180 euros, which is around about $200 per metric ton of CO2. And so he said that the political support for a price on CO2 that is really biting and making a difference is simply not there. So this is far too uh, cheap for a price per ton of CO2, and this wouldn't make a difference. And I agree with him on that. And uh, he says it's also paradoxical that we would advocate protection of the climate, yet at the same time, Uh, you know, policies in Germany promote everything that is damaging the climate from air travel, building more homes, eating meat, driving cars, and so on. So everything that's going on in the economy, according to him, is sort of damaging the climate, which is true in the sense that everything requires CO2 emissions, of course. And so German politics, of course, have been inconsequential. They didn't uh, substantially reduce CO2 emissions, and the renewable energy technology has so far failed to have any substantial impact, which is true. He's very honest on that. And then he kind of advocates his own thing, which is social pressure, asking your neighbors, you know, um, why are you booking an ocean cruise for vacation? Why are you driving SUVs and so on? So this is his sort of solution for the political um, non-accomplishment of real CO2 reductions in Germany. I mean, that, sounds, had- that sounds very old school East German. <laughs> Uh, yeah, kind of, although the East German government didn't really have that goal. It's just the outcome of the political and economic system, I think. So they, they wanted to be more productive, you know, building more tanks and so on. No, but I just mean like neighbors reporting on neighbors and everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see your point. Everybody yeah, yeah, controlling true. everybody's business. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's a unified... Oh, one question, thing. Stefan, before you move on, just to help us clarify. So he's saying that, you know, this almost $200 uh, tax, carbon tax is not enough. Can you give like a ballpark figure about what that would mean in terms of like your, you know, the gasoline prices that a person would pay just so that people get like the magnitude of what he's saying wouldn't work? So I, I don't know exactly uh, the numbers from the top of my head, but that was, would, you know, have already have a substantial impact, like, uh, you know, a quarter uh price spike for gasoline or diesel or something like that, I I believe. Um, But that's, so it would have a substantial impact on the price in in percentages, but it wouldn't mean that people stop driving because of this, because driving, you know, is just so valuable that you wouldn't stop doing that. You would still emit, you know, maybe a little bit less CO2, but you would still, you know, use your car or, you know, travel uh, to your vacation via air travel and so on. So I agree with him in the sense that, oh, yeah, even when we see price spikes in fuels, in fossil fuels, we don't see a massive reduction. Like when, you know, the oil embargo in the 1970s and 80s happened, that didn't like end the driving. Temporarily, it, you know, caused a bottleneck in in fuel supply, but people were, were, you know, willing to pay the price, the higher price of gasoline and diesel. So, and then he, he has this uh, um, solution for that. So the, the social pressure thing, and then also he advocates a post-growth economy. And that would entail dismantling the industry, 
um, with a reduction of work hours for, of 20 to 20 hours per week for an industrial worker and you know income losses accordingly because he acknowledges that yes we need to become poorer if we really want co2 reductions and then he suggests in your free time you and you know you do something else like growing your own food in your backyard or something else um so the, he's honest and consequential in his thinking like if really the goal is to massively reduce CO2 emissions, that would make a difference in, in climate. The rich people need to get poor and the poor people in the world need to stay poor. Um, I, I would argue with him that this is not really how it pans out. There will probably be not the same number of people on the planet after his uh, central planning takes place. Yeah, I mean, no growth is really a misnomer because all yeah. you can do is a... a, a you, economy either progresses or it collapses. There's no such thing as level growth in part because we ha we can't do the same things over and over. We have to get better at doing them. And even if you just look at resources, right? Like if you said, mm -hmm. let's just use the same amount of oil and gas every year, well, it gets harder and harder to find. So you need people to be engaging in innovation even to stay the same, let alone for things to get better. And so if you just ban our ability to innovate, what it really means is the complete inability to have technology at all. Right. So in the sense, uh, you know, compared to what advocates of something like the Green New Deal in the United States uh, have been saying about, you know, we will create new jobs and be better off actually after like so and so many decades, we will, we will be richer and just do the same thing that we do today, just more efficient and, and with better technology. He acknowledges this is not true. We need to be be poorer as a result of the the uh, proper policies as he advocates them. Now, this is you know a German professor, an academic with a bizarre anti-human flourishing agenda, and you would might ask, how is this relevant? Like, what what's the news here? Like, Germans are crazy in energy policies. That's true, but I want to compare that with something that is supposedly much 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 better and different. And this comes from the United States Senate. And the Senate has recently passed um, a new bill that was initiated by Lisa Murkowski, who is a senator from Alaska for the Republican Party. And it's called the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act. And it's supposed to improve the situation of US uh, nuclear reactors and, and the operators of these reactors financially by allowing 40-year power purchasing contracts for for the government right now it's restricted to 10 years at above market rates so this could help uh, increasing the profits of nuclear uh, power operators and it also will accelerate the development of, of advanced nuclear reactors you know under the under the uh, government programs so i would disagree with many of this particularly i think the government needs to get out of the way instead of getting involved more and more financially in these things. But, you know, a lot of uh, nuclear advocates will probably welcome this kind of development where the government takes interest, a positive interest in nuclear power. And so Isa Murkowski is known from everything I've seen. She's from Alaska and she's pro-energy development in Alaska, so oil and gas and so on. So she's sort of on the right side of things, even if you disagree on, on any particulars. And, but I want to read you two quotes from her um, in reaction to passing of the bill. So the first one is, I'm excited to be moving legislation related to nuclear energy, mineral security, energy efficiency, and carbon capture, utilization and sequestration out of the committee. So this is what this legislation is about. And then she says, these measures will help develop innovative technologies. Okay, that's the nuclear part responsibly reduce our energy and water consumption and protect our economy and national security. Now, this is interesting to me because it actually acknowledges the green ideal of, you know, reduce energy consumption, water conservation, you know, getting more, more energy efficient and, um, you know, protect our economy and national security. This is a bit vague because it could be... Uh, related to the nuclear stuff in a sense uh, of, of uh, the fuel cycle. But this is also the rhetoric that the Greens usually use, right? They are saying, well, we want, you know, to be more efficient and then we can do the same things over and over again um, in the future with better technology. And what I 
what I find interesting is that this minimizing your footprint ideology is so widespread that you, if, you, if you're looking for candidates in the U.S. Senate, even those that are supposedly pro-energy and would be, you know, named climate deniers and fossil fuel shells by their opponents, even these people adopt a certain type of language that acknowledges the green ideal of minimizing the footprint. So although the German professor, of course, is much more radical and, you know, Murkowski is not remotely in, on that level of anti-human flourishing, I think that we are losing the uphill battle right now because we do not acknowledge that the ideal of the Greens are wrong. This ideal is wrong, and we do adopt their language and you know framing things. So every every time some legislation gets passed, even if if it's pro nuclear and pro more energy, we sort of have to you know compromise in the language, or the politicians feel they have to compromise on the language and say, well, this is actually promoting energy efficiency and you know minimize our footprint and conserve some water and so on. So there's no, it's not the opposite of the Green New Deal. It's just we have either the Green New Deal radicals or we have a compromised version of that. Maybe with a little, you know, a few nuclear reactors tossed into the wind and solar future that we that we aim for. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there is a really deep current of guilt that runs through people that we've been taught to feel guilty about the very thing that enables us to survive, and that is transforming nature and impacting nature and that you know some people are crusading in the name of destroying our ability to do that but then even the people who are resisting it saying well look we have to do it somewhat we have to have some impact there's a real kind of guilt and saying well let's do it as you know little as we can get away with versus being really proud to be a human being that has the potential to transform nature so that we can live a real human life. I mean, if you, uh, I think Alex has talked about whether in this podcast or in various places, there's a scene in a book that we mention all the time, Atlas Shrugged, where you have this industrialist sitting in his house and there's a nice party going on and he's watching a storm outside and reflecting on this fact that how amazing is it that, you know, every other animal is just caught in the storm and we would be too if we hadn't used the power of the human mind in order to improve our human environment and just taking a real pride in that. And, and part of that would be being really proud of the fact that we can create as much energy as we do today and being very ambitious and wanting to have a lot more energy and use a lot more energy in the future. And of course, you want to use less energy energy all else being equal to achieve the same goal um but you want to use as much energy as you can so that you can make human flourish so that humans can flourish as much as possible and the even that as a goal strikes people as something that, that they definitely don't take pride in and then that makes you very vulnerable to the people who say no we don't want to compromise we want to have no growth we want to have real poverty because they are just being more consistent with a basic ideal that you've implicitly accepted. And like, I think most people accept it unwittingly and unknowingly, but it still does damage. And that's why I think one of our top priorities uh, at the Center for Industrial Progress is just to offer a new ideal of human flourishing that is consistent with uh, human progress and it's consistent with industrial progress and anti-pollution that is we're concerned with minimizing negative impacts and i think that points to you know as dispiriting as today's debate is there's a real opportunity to differentiate yourself if you know if you're a republican you can differentiate yourself from the democrats um not by letting them own the issue of environment but precisely by taking over the issue of human flourishing including a flourishing human environment so, Stefan, I'm going to turn to my next or my first story. So much of the country in the United States has been enduring a heat wave this past week. We certainly were here where I was in Pennsylvania, where we had temperatures upwards of 100 degrees, which is pretty unusual um, 
at least in terms of my experience, which is having lived here for only a year. So take that for what it's worth. Um, but we saw inevitably a lot of stories blaming climate change. And so there's a New York Times headline that said heat waves in the age of climate change, longer, more frequent and more dangerous. And in the article, it cites the U.S. Global Change Research Program reporting that, quote, since the 1960s, the average number of heat waves defined as two or more consecutive days where the daily lows exceeded historical July and August temperatures in 50 major American cities has tripled. And you might have noticed that the, the data it cited was historic lows. And Ronald Bailey from Reason Magazine pointed out that, yeah, that is accurate, but it's also odd that they're looking at the daily low temperatures rather than the daily high temperatures. And so he went and looked at the 2017 fourth national climate assessment report that showed that heat waves measured as daily high or high daily temperatures are becoming less common, uh, less common in the contiguous U S not more frequent. And I think that's interesting and it's worth knowing. And it's, surprising that the times didn't at least mention that because certainly it uh was it's not exactly buried in some unknown researcher's footnote but even setting that aside i mean look there was a heat wave and i mentioned you know here we got up to 100 degrees now thankfully in my household we were saved by human ingenuity in the form of our air conditioning units uh unfortunately we overloaded a circuit uh a few times. And so like the, when we were, you know, not paying attention, uh, our upstairs power wasn't on. And by the time we realized it and we're ready to go to bed, it was sweltering. And now thankfully this is a really easily fixable problem, right? We just went and switched the circuit breaker on and off and eventually moved some plugs around. Um, but I mean, imagine a full scale blackout in conditions where it's a hundred degrees or more, it becomes certainly a real, uh, painful situation, but I mean, it can also be a very dangerous situation. And one of the really terrifying things to me is that because of anti-fossil fuel policies, it is becoming more likely that more people will face full scale blackouts in precisely these kinds of extreme weather conditions. So, I mean, the first thing that's happening as we've talked about in this show is that the world is increasing our reliance on unreliable wind and solar and, you know, as we've talked about, that increases risks of blackouts. We discussed the example in South Australia where this actually happened because of the, you know, extreme amount of wind that they, uh, capacity that they have and the um, fact that there was less wind than predicted. And then we're also at the same time decreasing the reliability of our fuel, shutting down coal, shutting down nuclear blocking natural gas pipelines. Um, you know, we've talked about in this show the way that, you know, New York has basically made it impossible to build pipelines running to New England and that New England has been able, uh, has been waving its hands and saying, we don't have the natural gas that we need to deal of times of extreme demand. And so I am not afraid of more heat waves. I'm afraid that our energy policy will make us more vulnerable to every heat wave. Any thoughts, Stefan? Yeah, so I, I think the rationale for looking at the minimum temperatures that you mentioned uh, in one of the articles, I think it was in your Times article, um, was uh, something like, oh, if the heat doesn't cool down during nighttime, then, uh, you know, this is particularly dangerous to vulnerable people like older people or sick people and so on, which, you know, has some plausibility in argument. But I've seen a lot of analysis of this situation, and it seems like the uh, heat waves of the 1930s of the Dust Bowl era were actually uh, significantly worse. This is sort of what the data suggests overall. And also, when you look at these statistics, these are sufficiently complex that you can look at it from all kinds of different angles. So you could say, well, um, you know, compared to the 1930s, what is the length of a heat wave? You know, what is the minimum temperature? What's the maximum? What's the average? You know, how many, many days a year? And so on. So there are so many like variables in this that you can cherry pick. And if you don't give the full picture of this, of course, you can make all kinds of arguments. 
And uh, we haven't even talked about something like the urban heat island effect, where, you know, maybe even the observational data of temperatures is somewhat off if we do not consider something like, oh, the populated areas have actually, you know, increased in size and created a sort of a temperature bias into the, the thermometer record and so on. So, you know, this would have to be discussed in great detail and with, you know, some depths of knowledge of the actual statistic, how they come together and, you know, what do they say. And, uh, but overall, it's not implausible that heat waves are getting, getting you know, somewhat stronger. The data in the uh, National Climate Assessment didn't suggest like a crazy rapid growth rate. It just said, okay, in the 1930s is what probably worse. And then it went down a little bit. And then, you know, starting in the 1970s, it went up a slight tick, but not as much uh, as uh, in the 1930s. So this is perfectly consistent with a mild warming trend in climate. Of course, you will get extreme weather. And even if the climate was perfectly stable, you would every now and then, just from the probability perspective, you would shatter some heat and some cold records all the time, even if the climate was perfectly stable, which is impossible, of course. But it, you don't get that picture if you don't carefully uh, analyze it and give the full context of this. And these news articles never give that. Stefan, what's your next story? So I have a have also a climate topic, uh, which is a cautionary tale of climate impact claims. And so there has been a study by um, some researchers in New Zealand who found that uh, island nations in the Pacific, like uh, Tuvalu, are not necessarily feeling uh, a big climate impact in the future on their tiny islands in the in the sense of drowning in, in rising sea levels. And so they simulated um, a small scale model of an actual island uh, from the island nation of Tuvalu. And they found that the, this island is growing with the tide, with the increasing sea levels. Uh, and that, that is very interesting. Um, previous research uh, from, from satellite uh, imagery also found that Many of these island nations, uh, island nations have actually increased uh, their total uh, landmass size over the recent decades, which is surprising because we know that sea levels are rising. They are, you know, rising since the last ice age, but in the 20th century, sea levels have risen overall, not substantially, but a little bit. So you would think that, oh yeah, if there's an island in the Pacific Ocean, you know, you assume it's static. So the higher the sea level, the smaller the island becomes. But that's not actually true because these coral atolls actually um, grow upwards and move upwards with rising sea levels. And so this is this is not uh, featured in the climate impact assessment so far because this is recent research, and this just goes to show. Much of the the reports we read and then um, some news outlet will pick that up and and say, oh, yeah, in the future, we will have like millions of climate refugees from these island nations. They will just, uh, you know, come to our coast and uh, need help because their homes are destroyed from climate change. And this is actually not true. It's not certain. There's a high level of uncertainty and um this this has not this in the reports and they often uh, say something like oh there's medium confidence which suggests something like a 50 50 chance of decreasing land mass in these island nations but you know this means there's high uh, there's a high level of uncertainty but in the media outlets it, it just says oh there there's a prediction of millions of climate refugees right um so i'll just read a, a bit from the abstract of this paper actually uh Challenging outputs from existing models based on the assumption that islands are geomorphically inert results results demonstrate that islands not only move laterally on reef platforms, but overwash processes provide a mechanism to build and maintain the freeboard of the island above sea level. Implications of island building are profound as it will offset existing scenarios of dramatic increases in island flooding. So... What this means in plain English is that, yeah, the other processes like, uh, you know, um, sand mass uh, and uh, movement upwards of the island will actually offset the existing scenarios that, that we are presented with of dramatic island flooding. And 
you know, this this is not in the IPCC projections, at least not to the extent that it should be. And uh, this this to me it indicates that we should be very careful about uh, impacts, even more so than about you know predictions of temperature increase. Because remember, we we are talking about we assume if the climate models are correct, there will be a certain amount of warming in the near future from CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases. And then on top of that, there will be certain impacts like sea level rise, right? And on top of that, then the economists come in and say, hey, this will have a a giant uh, amount of impact on our economy in the year 2050 or 2100. And as it shows here, there's... This is just not certain. A lot of this is highly speculative and often it's just not as we assume. Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the like lessons of the 20th century was the failure of sl- centrally planning an economy. And although I don't think this is the most fundamental way to think about the issue, um, the economist Hayek pointed out that there's the central planners don't have the knowledge, particularly the kind of knowledge of time and place as he called it not knowing the details of like this particular patch of land is the best one to drill on versus that patch of land in order to actually centrally plan an economy and so that this had to fail and i think what's going on is one thing that's going on is that the the climate catastrophists who want to like certainly do want to centrally plan the economy certainly the energy economy it's even broader in that they're they want to centrally plan the ecosystem and they have nowhere near the knowledge to, and the climate and they have nowhere near the knowledge they need to plan that now they would say well no we're just preventing us from ruining the ecosystem we're preventing us from impacting the climate and that way that you know it, it will run itself but i think part of what you're seeing in stories like this is that nature is actually very adaptive and one of, and just as free individuals are very adaptive. And so if you don't appreciate the complexity of these systems and then the adaptive nature of these systems, including the adaptive nature of human beings, you're just like destined to create a train wreck if you try to control it. My next story brings us to Berkeley, always on the cutting edge of government control of our lives. Berkeley has become the first city in the nation to ban the installation of natural gas lines in new homes. So this new ordinance is going to require all new single family homes, townhomes, small apartment buildings to be purely electric in its infrastructure. And the city is going to include commercial buildings and larger residential structures eventually over time. Um, The California Energy Commission chairman, David uh, Hochschild, I think is how you pronounce it, he um, spoke at a meeting saying that other cities, 50 cities, in fact, across California were considering similar actions and looking to Berkeley for uh, inspiration and guidance as they develop legislation. And one of the, I guess, one thought on this, um, one of the mistakes that I've seen, or I think it's a mistake, is when natural gas producers will put position gas as a bridge fuel to our inevitable transition to wind and solar. And along similar lines, I've seen Republicans celebrating natural gas for lowering CO2 emissions. And I think what you're seeing in Berkeley is that these kinds of arguments are short-sighted and self-defeating because like, if our goal is just to lower CO2 as much as possible without a more basic or more important or or fundamental goal of promoting human flourishing, including energy abundance and climate safety, then we should be celebrating the banning of natural gas. And if we're inevitably transitioning to wind and solar, then we shouldn't worry too much about these bans because natural gas is easily replaceable. And that's why I think what what you need to have is a clear, what we call uh, 100, that is your inspiring goal. And that should it, have, I I think, be connected to this larger vision of human flourishing of which lowering CO2 is at best one component. And, you know, if if we actually were to follow Berkeley in banning natural gas and banning coal and banning nuclear as people want to do, I mean, you're talking about the complete obliteration of our way of life. And so, I mean, this is incredibly, I mean, reckless and destructive, uh, it's only made it 
all plausible because they're turning to electricity, which is still powered predominantly by fossil fuels. So, I mean, it's completely dishonest even to present this as a we're getting off of natural gas. It's at best, we're changing the way that we use natural gas and other fossil fuels, as well as whatever other reliable uh, sources of energy Berkeley has access to. And, um, you know, it's at most saying that maybe someday when these are allegedly fully replaceable by wind and solar, then, you know, we'll have banned natural gas. But even taking this as like a, an achievement precisely uh, is, um, I think, extremely troublesome. And uh, I have another reason that I do not want to live in Berkeley. Yeah, I... I agree with your assessment. I also see this a lot with like big oil companies like BP pandering to that, like, oh, we need to help the energy transition to wind and solar with, you know, more natural gas. And of course, then the other side will have the opportunity to say, well, actually, we have far too many natural gas power plants already, you know, operating and we need to shut them down early. And uh, so that once you get on the sort of battleground where your opponent is uh, has the high the moral high ground you know the um, ideal is to minimize co2 emissions to zero and so on you cannot win this and i don't know exactly what something like bp strategy is in this but this is definitely a, a losing battle and yeah, it's it's not it's not going to work. I also see a lot of people making arguments like, "Oh, we have actually decreased methane emissions by this and that many percentage points, and uh, we are getting more efficient." And overall, well, we are better than coal. You know, at least you have to give us the, the difference between natural gas and coal, and so on. And this, these are all like losing battle. They, you, it's like these people are intentionally picking battlefields where they will lose and must lose. Because you're not saying, well, we need, you know, proper energy abundance to actually technologically solve our problems. And that includes climate safety, that includes all kinds of, of issues. And this, like, no matter what the climate of the future is, we will need a lot of reliable energy. And the alternatives that are proposed are not going to deliver that. So wind and solar will not in the foreseeable future be able even to catch up with fossil fuel growth. Uh, and there, there are economic and technological reasons for that. So, you know, every time you see someone, and this is often in the nuclear industry or in the natural gas industry, and they are saying, well, we this can, this actually perfectly complement the renewables. And so immediately they are acknowledging that this, uh, you know, no matter what happens, uh, the, the energy transition to these particular wind and solar technologies needs to happen. And this is just, this will end up in the end at the radical position of this German professor that says, no, we actually need to be impoverished to accomplish our actual moral goals, which is minimizing the human footprint. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, it, it totally makes sense that, you know, if I'm a natural gas company, I want to point out my superior to alternatives, but they will inevitably attack coal on the basis of its CO2 emissions, never mind that they, you know, have albeit less, but still real CO2 emissions. And so, you know, if you concede that that's a goal, you're putting a ticking, you know, a, a ticking clock on your lifespan as a company. But then the what is the one competitor that they will not attack is the really lousy one that we most need somebody to speak out for. And that is the solar and wind that is actually being championed as their replacement. And, you know, people accuse business people of being greedy, but like, you know, not so greedy, apparently, that they won't, you know, stand up against what is aiming to be the complete destruction of their industry. And I think that's a real tragedy. And thankfully, you know, there are uh, companies who are speaking out better. And, you know, we like to work with those companies and help them speak out more effectively for the goodness that their industry does and the superiority of their industry. And, um, you know, uh, as I'll mention at the end of the show, if that's something that you want help with at your company, uh, you can email me and, you know, we'll discuss how we can be helpful. Stefan, what's your next story? So this, this story I called uh, how Ted Nordhaus would like to boil a frog. 
And so the Breakthrough Institute's Ted Nordhaus, which is not uh, identical with, with but related to the uh, Nobel Prize winner William Nordhaus, uh, published an article recently called Climate Change Requires Big Solutions, But Baby Steps Are the Only Way to Go. And uh, he points out that uh, carbon pricing policies like, you know, CO2 taxes and so on, they are really hard sells. And approaches like the Green New Deal are, you know, less effective. And a lot of economists uh, don't like uh, these sort of picking winners and losers policies like in, mentioned in the Green New Deal and because they are economically inefficient. And um, so he correctly finds, and this is a quote from the article, government subsidies typically make economists pull their hair out. They encourage rent seeking and require policymakers with imperfect knowledge to make decisions about which technologies to champion. And it's true, from th synthetic fuels to biofuels, solyndra solar cells to plutonium breeder reactors, governments have bet on plenty of energy technology losers. So in the in many economists' minds, something like a carbon tax, a price per ton of CO2 emissions, um, is sort of the ideal thing because it's technolo technologically neutral. It doesn't say how you save the CO2. It just puts either a cap on it or a price on it. And then, you know, private companies and individuals are free to choose their pathways to how they want to decrease their CO2 emissions. And uh, so... When you do something like a tax, though, you will quickly run into um, resistance. And he mentioned the French Yellow Vest protest, uh, you know, which uh, was over uh, fuel price increases uh, after uh, uh, such a tax in, in France. And um, that is politically untenable, he says. And, you know, France uh, had, to, had to pull off the, this particular tax because there were, there were so many demonstrations and actually riots in the streets of Paris. And uh, this is politically untenable because it makes visible the actual cost of such policy, right? That's his argument. And on the other hand, he says, like, climate denial, you know, sort of the Republican uh, position is not viable either. So we need some progress. We need to do some climate policy. The question now to Ted Nordhaus is how to do this, how to boil the frog, right? And... Um, so here's another quote from, uh, from uh, Ted Nordhaus. Um, Beyond the efficacy of those investments, the fact that they obscure the cost of climate mitigation policies is a political feature, not a bug. Pricing carbon is hard because it demands that people pay today to avoid uncertain climate impacts far off into the future. Because public subsidies are usually paid for with general tax revenue, they work in exactly the opposite manner promising tangible benefits, better air quality, new jobs, perhaps even new industries today while burying the cost in much larger government budgets. So his, his basic argument is essentially, okay, the citizenry is not the sovereign, it's just a bunch of, I would call, idiots, and they need to be pushed in the right direction with sort of this Machiavellian nefarious political schemes where they don't actually know what they are going to pay for and, and how, what the hardship of a certain policy will be. So it's not that the citizen should, you know, make up, make up his mind about what's actually the trade-off. What I, am I buying? Is this worth it? Are the impacts worse than the tax or is the tax worth than the impact? So he sort of argues that, oh, we should obscure that from the general public. We shouldn't discuss this. We should just make small little steps like this frog uh, in the boiling uh, pot, in the pot with boiling water. If you, if you just throw him in, in, the, in a pot of water that's already boiling, he, will, he might jump out and not get where you need him to get. But if you just put him in a, in a pot with cold water and then put the stove up and, and boil him slowly, that will do the trick. Right. And I, I find this very, very disturbing, actually. Uh, let me just read another quote from him. Um, Ultimately, we, the choice we face is between some action and no action. Neither economists dream of rationalizing environmental policy through the power and efficiency of markets, nor progressive environmentalists' hopes of heroic state-led mobilization to save the planet are likely to do much to address the problem. So, and here you, you can sort of see the fallacy, right? So he says, 
well, it's either doing something or doing nothing. These are the binary options, which is not true, by the way. We can do, you know, a half measure at least. And, and then he says, well, we need to do something that's already, already fixed in. But even if we assume, okay, we have decided that we need to do something on, on the climate threat and the only thing to do uh, so is a CO2 emission reduction. Even then, the question would be at least, how much do we need to reduce it? Like, what's the target temperature level and subsequently the, the CO2 level that we want, right? So it's, it's not a, a zero or one, a binary decision, action or no action. And it's, you need some precision in thinking. And for that, you would actually need transparency, in my view. You, you need to make very clear what is the cost of the policy proposed? What is the cost of the Green New Deal, right? If it's just an obscure piece of legislation, which the actual Green New Deal introduced in the, in the House of Representatives in the United States, if we, if we just look at that, it's just an obscure, vague thing that will probably be very harmful and costly, but we don't actually know. And... Ted Nordhaus, he actually advocates, oh, yeah, it should be even more obscure. People shouldn't even notice it until it's too late and they are, you know, in the position that, where we need them. It's sort of this power elite decides and then they just need to trick the citizen into complying. And I, I find this very, very disturbing, actually. I, I think what we do need is clarity and, and not obfuscation of, of issues like this. Yeah, I mean, this is really outrageous, particularly... so. <laughs> The, I think the only plausible argument for a carbon tax is something like, oh, it makes the cost visible. So at least we can decide, hey, is it worth it? Except that the carbon tax doesn't do it, right? Because first of all, they start always with a phony price. Um, I mean, Germany at least had the decency to start with a phony price on the high side of what you usually see, uh, or at least in, in as we discussed in the story you mentioned. Um, usually it's here's our $15 or $35 uh, carbon tax. So it starts with a phony price. And then as we talked about in previous uh, episodes, it's leaving out the cost and misproduction, right? Because the, you know, the, what inevitably happens is that people will not use their, they're using less energy and are, you are missing out on all of the wealth and jobs that would be created if you did not have the tax because people are forced to use more expensive forms of energy. And then it's also, you're not counting all the foregone consumption, right? Like how many people, because of more expensive energy are not doing things that would have really added to their life. Like, you know, taking a family vacation to visit the grandparents or, you know, the thousands of other things that, that they would otherwise be doing. And so the idea that, well, that like, look, people are rejecting a carbon tax when it has these phony prices that still hide most of its costs. And we still think that that is too open and honest about the cost of our carbon policy. So we're going to hide them even further. Like that is so outrageous uh, and shows a real contempt for people's right to judge for themselves. Like, do I think that the price that is going to be imposed on me to solve this speculative uh, harms that are going to occur, you know, when I'm probably dead, like, that is not what you do in a free country like that is but the you know the mentality is like as you said we know what's best and so the only question is not how do we persuade people it's how do we dupe people all right my next story so we're right now celebrating the anniversary of the moon landing and unsurprisingly climate alarmists are once again calling for a moon shot for climate change which i mean i guess is is better than a Manhattan project. Although uh, I think the connotations for that one are probably more accurate. Um, but the, it, cause the idea is that like, look, if we have this national mission that we're all on board for, where the government declares, we're going to throw every resource in society at, at this problem of solving climate change, then, you know, people will be really inspired and we can do it. Um, Never mind that as a very authoritarian impulse of like, we're going to set a goal for society, including like, you know, you thought you had plans for your job. You thought you had plans for your wealth. No, we are, we are going to decide. But it, the putting this in the same category as getting to the moon is a, I mean, is a complete error because what that was is an engineering challenge. And what it required was mostly pouring a lot of money into it. And, 
you know, if there's one thing that governments can do effectively, it's to take a bunch of money from people and spend it, you know, in, in one certain place. And it, but what that didn't involve was fundamentally changing the way that we live. And yet that is what's really involved in climate, right? Because the challenge is not engineering. Like we can theoretically power most things without using CO2 energy, though even there you still have things like flight and ships that we can't do. Um, but the challenge is really, can we do it affordably? That is, can we affordably do these things? And, you know, as I talked about in an earlier segment, one of the things we know from history is that the way we actually get innovations and particularly innovations that are affordable for millions and billions of people is not from top down orders from the government, but from freedom where producers are each free to come up with their own ideas and then compete in order to offer the best products at the lowest prices. And then consumers are free to choose what they think is best for their lives. And so really what the climate alarmists are calling for is not another moonshot, but another five-year plan. And like we know how well that turned out for communist countries, and there's no reason to think it would be any different this time. Yeah, so my thoughts on this is I'm generally uh, very skeptical of, of NASA's uh, mission from the very start. You know, besides of the military applications, I, I don't think um, the moon landing was that important that you should pour a lot of government uh, money on that. But so we have to recognize that, of course, you can spend like billions and billions of dollars to get a couple of people to the moon. And that's a great accomplishment. And there was a lot of bravery and, you know, uh, very able, capable and, and uh, you know, heroic people, actually, like, this is not something that every human would be capable of, of course. Um, I, I don't want to take away from that. But the, the, the issue is something like climate impact from reducing CO2 emissions. This is actually a, an issue that is a challenge that is orders of magnitudes more challenging in a sense because it requires the entire economy to turn over so it's one thing to take a chunk of the economy and spend that on something you know uh, like a moon landing for for a handful of, of humans but this is more like bringing like a million citizens every year to the moon this is like order at least in all of many probably several orders of magnitude more more difficult because you need to so in my in my view, you will crush the entire economy, and that's not what the moon landings did. They were quite expensive, but they didn't crush the economy, and they didn't require to you know put your trust in technologies that didn't even exist and, and were never tested. It was you know a lot of engineering was necessary to develop these technologies, but this this is this is a totally different order of magnitude in, in the challenge, and uh, so it's it's. Yeah, I think it's more more like a World War II uh, squared or something where you have to overhaul the economy into a war economy, at least temporarily. And this time with with the climate moonshot, it will actually be permanently. So this is... Well, and yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the other example, I think that this is more like, and it's not a perfect analogy, but it captures some important elements, is, you know, the government has not just set goals like create an atom bomb or put a man in the moon in, you know, Richard Nixon said like, we are going to, uh, end, we are going to cure cancer in 10 years. And so the government said, this is a goal and poured money into that, but it was a system that we did not understand. And the problems that had to be solved, or as you're saying, orders of magnitude more difficult than the engineering problems that had to be solved. And we haven't solved them. Um, and it's, you, the the sheer fact that you throw a lot of resources at something, first of all, doesn't justify doing that. But second of all, it doesn't guarantee success when the problem is really hard. And people, I think, are dramatically underestimating how hard these problems are to solve. Um, and if you take that seriously, then the idea that this could work, let alone that it would be moral to attempt, I think would be thrown into far greater question. All right, that's it for this week. If you have any questions, comments, love mail, or hate mail, you can email me, Don Watkins, at don at industrialprogress.net. 
And if you have any interest in a speech by Alex or anyone else from our team, we've got a growing lineup of great speakers at all different price points. So you can email me about that at dawn at industrialprogress.net. And if you're interested in help with messaging, if your organization has a high stakes messaging project and you'd like to work with us, you can let me know that as well. Please subscribe to our newsletter at alexepsteinlist.com. And if you describe if you subscribe soon, rather that is, you'll get our weekly newsletter uh, updating you on our activities. And you'll also get our weekly energy clarity email course, which is kind of the best education in energy that is available for free anywhere. So I hope everybody enjoyed this episode and we will be back next week with some more great topics and very likely with Alex. Until then, I'm Don Watkins with Stefan Henna, and this has been Power Hour. Power Hour. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of energy. Power Hour. The antidote to shallow thinking about energy issues.